In this talk, Dr. Andrew Crowther, Senior Collection Manager at the South Australian Museum, takes us behind the scenes into the Marine Invertebrates Collection at the Museum Science Centre in Adelaide. The collection is a priceless public resource containing millions of specimens collected from the mid 19th century to the present day. In this talk, Andrew will introduce the collection, the team who manage it, and the work they do supporting scientific study. Hi everybody, I'm Andrea Crowther. I'm just here to give you a few behind the scenes looks at the Marine Invertebrates Collection of the SA Museum. So I thought I'd start first with telling you who is around the collection. So we'll meet the team and also the collection. So first off it are the staff that work here. Um, so from left to right, we have myself. So I'm Dr. Andrea Crowther. I'm a senior collection manager here in Marine Invertebrates at the SA Museum. Next up, we have Dr. Rachel King, who's our senior researcher. Um, then we have Moon Lee, who's our collections assistant. And then Shirley Sorokin, who's another collection manager of Marine Invertebrates. We also have some research honorees or honorary researchers. And here we have Dr. Wolfgang Ziedler, who used to be a curator here at the Marine Invertebrates Collection, but now comes in and does his own research. And then we have Danielle's, Dr. Danielle Stringer, who's a postdoc with Rachel and comes in to do research on their projects. As well as the staff and the honorary researchers, we have a dedicated team of volunteers who come in once or some of them twice a week to help with projects. So um, from left to right, not including the staff, we have Ingrid, Amanda, Alan, Brenda, Don, Peter and Tony. And um, we're missing Mike from that photo. Um, so they're our volunteers that come in and help us with many different projects. Um, as for the collection, we like to think of it as a library of life. So most of us are familiar with the concept of a library of books. Um, so books are available to um, the public to be looked at and borrowed and shared. And we have a similar situation, except instead of books, we have preserved animals, and that is our collection. When you think about the tree of life, um, so here's an example on this slide. We cover most of the branches of a tree of life. So we have over 20 phyla of animals that we cover in our collection. So anything from periphera, the sponges, through to even chordates, because we look after ascidians and ascidians are urochordates. So they're included along that branch there. Um, even though our name is marine invertebrates, it's a bit misleading. We definitely do cover marine animals. We also cover um, invertebrate animals that are found in terrestrial landscapes, so land snails or earthworms, for example. We also cover animals that are found in freshwater habitats. And then in particular for Rachel's research, um, we cover animals that are from aquifers and boars and different habitats like that. The physical collection, um, we have two main storerooms and we call them the dry store and the spirit store. So on the left is an example from our dry store. So the dry store is ambient temperature and we have about 120 metal cabinets and each cabinet can include up to 30 drawers. So that's the example there on the left and that's showing our dried sea stars collection in our dry store. About three quarters of that room um, hold our dried mollusk collection, so the shell collection. And I'll talk a little bit more about the history of that part of our collection. Um, however, if you have soft bodied animals or, or the soft parts of animals, you can't really dry them out and store them to be used in the future. So what we do with those kind of animals is that they're preserved in either 70% ethanol or 10% um, formalin, depending on the type of animal. So those specimens need to be stored at under different conditions. And this room on the right there is our spirit store. Um, so it's at about 18 degrees, um, and that helps prevent evaporation, for example, um, and it allows us to keep things kept in ethanol for long term. 
Overall, we don't know exactly how many lots or jars or boxes of specimens we have, but we're estimating about 250,000 to 300,000. Um, only about 60,000 of those are data-based at the moment. So we've got a long way to go with transcribing these the data related to the specimens. An important part of our collection includes the photo index slides. Um, so these are photographs that were taken of animals when they were alive and in situ. So when where they were living, what they were associated with, that kind of thing. And the powerful thing about this collection of photographs is that we have the corresponding specimen in our collection. So you can have a look at the specimen once it's preserved, but then you can look at the photograph from when it was alive and get more information about it. In terms of scientific research, our collection holds um, thousands of type specimens. So when someone describes a species, they often designate a holotype specimen. So this specimen is like the physical definition of that species. So very important in taxonomic research, for example. Um, and as I mentioned briefly before, our mollusk collection is historically significant. So Sir Joseph, Sir Joseph Verco started this collection in the 1800s and it has a long history of shell collection, so private donations being given to really boost this collection. The Malacological Society of South Australia was the first of, us, of its kind in Australia. So we have a long history of, of mollusks, uh, mollusk research and mollusk donations for this collection. One of our earliest, if not the earliest, collected specimen in our collection was a chitin collected by French explorers in Tasmania in 1804. This slide just shows um, an example of the photo index slides. So like I was mentioning before, when we have um, jars on our shelves, it often looks like a sea of beige because we lose a lot of the colour from the specimens once they're collected. Having the photo index slides, so photographs from when the animals were alive, means you can relive the colour, the pattern, the habitat, the associations that that species had when it was alive. Hi, my name is Bill Prickett and I'm a wildlife sculptor and member of the Society of Wildlife Artists. I'm based in the UK and I've been a sculptor now for over 20 years. Uh, but prior to that I worked with animals and I spent a lot of time studying animals all over the world. Now a great source of inspiration for my work is the marine environment and using my favoured medium of wood uh, I've sculpted quite a few of its inhabitants. These would include things such as the leafy sea dragon, uh, the Spanish dancer nudibranch and several different species of ray. But my favourite subject is the octopus. Now not only are octopuses fascinating and intelligent animals, they also have the ability of creating the most incredible sculptural forms. My most recent octopus sculpture is the octopus coffee table, or octobol, and this was carved from birch plywood. If you'd like to see this and uh, some other examples of my work and bronzes, then please have a look at my website at www.billprickett.co.uk. For the last seven or eight years, having things data-based has been a priority for our collection. Um, what this picture photo on this slide shows are our original collection ledgers. So these needed to have all the information handwritten into them when we registered a specimen. However, that is very time consuming and those books are actually quite costly, about $1,000 each. These days, we capture all the data using our database. So we use KEMU, that's the name of the relational database we use. And it's a program that's used by many collections around Australia as well. The powerful thing about relational databases, as opposed to Excel or something like that, um, is that you can have modules, so information that relates to certain topics, um, and examples of those are on the left-hand panel in this slide. So we have catalogue, taxonomy, collection events, that kind of information. 
Um, and each module can then have very detailed information relating to it. So the current slide is showing an example of a catalogue record. So here we put information that relates directly to that particular specimen. So that includes the registration number, who registered it, what kind of specimen is it, that kind of information. That's, that catalogue record is then linked to other modules. So an example here is the taxonomy module. So the specimen C14252 has been identified as the taxonomic record of microcyclops. So we're making all these little links for the catalogue record. So taxonomy, where it was collected, where it's now held, all this information is kind of like a little spider web linking to the catalog record. Um, everything that we enter into our EMU database is eventually uploaded to the Atlas of Living Australia. And this is also something that um, museum collections around Australia all do. So it makes our data accessible to anybody. So anybody can go to Atlas of Living Australia, ala.org.au and search their databases for our museum collections. Another project that we did um, using the Atlas of Living Australia was to get um, online transcription of some of our data. So what that entailed was that was taking photographs of specimens in our collection with their label. These were uploaded onto Digivol, which was the project platform. Online transcribers were then, um, volunteers were then able to transcribe what they saw from our labels into an online um, form. That data was then sent back to us, which we then uploaded into our in-house in KEMU database. And then that eventually was then also re-uploaded onto the Atlas of Living Australia. Again, making it more accessible for everybody to be able to search. Um, another sort of um, step in the technology direction is using um, thermal printers to help us with labelling the specimens um, and also using barcodes integrated into these labels. So the registration number is rendered as a barcode and that can help us um, with processing loans in and out for example, more efficiently. As for growing the collection, um, it, I just mean how do we increase the number of specimens? And here's just a few examples. So we do still get shell donations, private shell collections. Um, an example on the top left photo here was one from last year, last year or the year before where there were basically two car loads worth of boxes of shells from um, a collection that had been bequeathed to us. So we are still processing that collection. Um, another recent collection that was donated is there on the right, and you can see some very nicely curated chitons that were part of that collection. Um, an interesting example of another donation is shown at the bottom um, where we have an enormous um, gorgonian or black coral that was um, collected by a commercial fisherman. Um, and that specimen itself is about six metres long and they donated it to the collection. Um, and local collectors that are out and about. So an example here is of an, of an Alicia Sacoglossin, and that was collected by um, Dan Monso, who a lot of you know. And then right on the right is an Argonauta octopus um, that we also have the egg case for. And this came via our discovery center. We do still do field work, although not as much as um, what may have been done in the past. So in, on the left, for example, um, a few of us have been involved with research cruises on the RV Investigator, which is um, Australia's research vessel, um, where we do deep sea sampling. Um, and on the right is a future field work where combined with bush blitz, we're off to Fowler's Bay at the end of this year, as long as COVID allows, um, and we'll be doing some collecting over there.
changing pace a bit, I just thought I'd talk about some projects that we've been up to. Um, an example of a visitor re visiting person coming to our collection is an artist called Krista Rosa, who is interested in sponges in particular that she finds on the beach. Um, and she came to our collection and photographed our sponges and then through her artwork, um, this is what she was able to do. Um, another project that in particular Shirley has been working on is to document all the pest species that we have in our collection. And this helps us um, be more collaborative with other, other um, agencies in South Australia. So this is an example of the Asian paddle crab. Um, previously, we had a specimen from the year 2000 that was collected from Outer Harbour. And then in 2019 and 2020, two more specimens were found. So having them part of the collection gives us um, a, a definite time and place of when and where these specimens were collected. So we've been able to tell from these specimens that, you know, one specimen in 2000, one in 2019, one in 2020 in similar areas, but they were all single males. So just one specimen, male specimen um, collected or found in usually fishing pots. Um, so this is part of what, like I said, trying to make connections with other agencies in SA. So, for example, PERSA Biosecurity in particular, citizen scientists um, and marine life societies, So, and looking at nine naturalists, things like that. Um, what we want to encourage is that the museum becomes a place where things are kept long term. So we get the specimen and all the data related to that and we're able to maintain that for a long term use and, and be able to search easily. Um, we've also been going back and databasing pest surveys that have been done in the past and sort of prioritising that in our, in our workflow. So this is a collaborative approach. Um, we talk often with Persa and Sadi on matters of pests. Um, not only we talk about the ex in extended or enhanced specimen and species data. So again, um, we try and keep up to date with taxonomic changes and synonyms. Um, and we make this data available to the broader network. But for us, you know, the most important thing is that we are the reference collection. So it's the best place to deposit pests or invasive species, as well as similar local species. So we've got that reference um, to go back to and compare. We also have the Australian Biological Tissue Collection here at the SA Museum. So we take a subsample and lodge it in that collection. Hi, I'm Nikki and I'm the face behind Lillian C. I'm a shell artist and I live in North Cornwall in the southwest of England. Um, I've beachcombed my entire life. I used to holiday with my grandparents by the sea and it's something I've always loved to do. So I really love that part of my job. Um, the first actual piece of artwork I made using shells was from some shells I collected on our honeymoon. And my husband and I traveled the southwest of England with our little dog and we picked up some shells um, from a few beaches and I framed them very similarly to the one you can see behind me. And lots of my friends and family really loved it, so I decided to try and start selling them. Uh, since then, my style has developed quite a lot, um, and I've done a few different things, lots of different shapes and designs. Um, I mostly use mussel shells now, as they seem to be the most popular. So I've always had that connection with the ocean from growing up, and I am also a marine biologist, so it's lovely to still be able to do something to do with the ocean. Changing pace a little bit again. Um, we've been going and looking through our collection and trying to database the very historical things. So we have historical sediments from Antarctica, for example. Um, so on the left is a, um, the sediments from Antarctica. They were taken on the Banzari expeditions, cruises led by Sir Douglas Mawson. Um, in the middle shows sediments that were taken by Sir Joseph Burko from local areas um, in the early 1900s. And then on the far right is actually um, mixed plankton lots that have come from Syro in Tasmania. 
Um, so again, these are all showing little bits of the environment at certain times. So we want this data to be available and accessible for other people to study. Um, another project that has been prioritised for databasing um, a few years ago was to look at our holdings of animals that were collected from deeper than 200 metres. So this was a, um, a project that was run by other institutions but wanted to know what do we have from 200 metres depth. And these are examples of things that were collected most recently on the RV investigator, for example, that are now part of our in, um, collection here at the SA Museum. Um, and through our two, two in particular dedicated volunteers, so Tony and Peter, they've been working at databasing our land snail holdings, which we do have a lot. Um, and in part of that, they were in um, conversation with John Stanisic, who was previously um, employed at the Queensland Museum as a mollusk um, researcher. And he has recently published his volume two of Australian land snails. And because of the interaction he had with Tony and Peter, he actually had, um, named a genus each after them. So in 2018, there's Huntiana, Stanisic 2018, and Robinsoniana, Stanisic 2018 of land snails. Now, again, talking about something different that we do here is that we have research that happens on the collections, which is one of the other main goals that we want for the use of our collection. Well, this is me, but this is an older photograph when I was doing field work in Singapore and getting very muddy. I'll start with Rachel as she's our senior researcher. Um, and we sort of joke that she has two GAB projects. Um, the first is GAB Terrestrial, and that's the Great Artesian base, Basin of Australia, where she looks at groundwater amphipods from systems in WA and SA. So that includes collecting species discovery, species description, and phylogenies. And there's some examples there on the left. Um, and then the GAB Marine is the Great Australian Bite. Again, looking at um, isopods, in particular the Arcturid isopod systematics, and looking at deep sea isopods and amphipods, collection systematic and research as well. So Wolfgang Ziedler, his um, expertise is in hyperid amphipods of the world, and he's working on a book about that. But he's publishing um, revisions of each family along the way um, in peer-reviewed journals. So he does. A, he spends a lot of time looking at tiny little amphipods that live on um, jellyfish in particular, the commensal with jellyfish. He looks down the microscope and then and on the left shows his um, scientific illustrations showing morphological features of these little amphipods. Shirley Sorokin is interested in particular in um, phylum periphera, so the sponges. Um, she recently described a new species called Tethia irisa, which was collected from the Great Australian Bite from about 1,000 metres. Um, and she, she was part of the um, group that was on the RV investigator cruise to collect these specimens as well. I'm interested in sea anemones in particular. Um, so with all the recent deep sea cruises, that has become the primary um, interest at the moment. Um, the deep sea sea anemones from Australia were poorly known um, and all these research cruises are helping us to increase the knowledge and also the collections. So in particular here at the SA Museum, our collection of sea anemones is growing through all these recent research cruises um, and we will continue to be the place where sea anemones are often um, lodged. We've also been trying hard to um, increase our collaborations with local and, and further afield collaborators. And so these are just a few of the um, institutions that we have um, strong collaboration already with and, and frequent conversations and research links with. This next art break introduces Suzette Muchati, an American artist whose giant nudibranch or sea slug sculptures burst with life and vivid colour. 
Suzette makes these remarkable likenesses using polystyrene foam, and you can see them here installed at the Anya Tisch Gallery in Houston, Texas. On the gallery walls you can also see painted portraits of sharks by Gao Hung. Like many of the artists in this presentation series, Suzette is also a professional scientist and teaches biology, ecology and sustainability to students at the University of Houston downtown. She sees making and showing environmental art as an opportunity to start conversations about climate change and the environmental impacts of human activity on the biosphere. You can see more of her imaginative and often surreal work on Instagram. Back to you, Andrea. So outreach is also a big part of what we do. Um, and some of it you will, you, people in Adelaide as general public will see and some of it you won't because it's more remote or um, behind the scenes or social media side of things. Um, so this photo is one of my most favourite ones of um, doing outreach where we had our Out of the Glass Roadshow, um, which is where we take um, educational to educational programs to regional SA. And in this particular trip, our last school was actually in Northern Territory, Mutujulu, um, at the base of Uluru. So this was the final day of our outreach and you can see Uluru in the background and our matching Bindi Irwin tops. Um, so again, outreach has many different forms. So we've worked on a coral display that um, supplemented the Great Barrier Reef virtual reality show that we had on. On the right are uh, some sponge, hex hexagonalid sponges that were on display for the recent Wonders exhibition. Um, the bottom um, middle, I am, Shirley and I, and Rachel actually, um, and Danielle, we worked at the Night Lab um, event where Shirley and I were running a trolley of life and a trolley of death, and we were talking about marine invertebrates that can do you good or do you harm. Um, and then final on the left was um, an in-conversation night with Buck Taylor, who was the submarine pilot who took um, Sir David Attenborough underwater to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so that was a really fun um, public event we had. Um, we also, we do quite a few back of house tours in particular more when COVID wasn't such an issue um, and we've been involved with STEM workshops or having um, school groups through our, um, our collection. Um, we also do regional displays so these are two of the most recent ones um, and that includes the one that was in Goolwa back in I think 2018 um, where we had a display of marine invertebrates that were that was designed to um, not necessarily go with but be part be in the same space as um, an artist's um, display so that is Krista Rosa there on the left um, with her artwork behind us and then on the right is a more recent one from Victor Harbour so both of them were supplementing or complementing artistic showcases so we're surrounded by artistic pieces and then we always try and take, you know, bring the real things. So real corals, real shells, real isopods, um, so people can see the real animals behind the art. Um, and this is an example of some of the road shows where I take a lot of hands-on things to do with the marine environment and um, get, teach people about the marine, um, not just invertebrates, but I do concentrate on marine invertebrates. Um, it's a very rewarding um, thing that I have done as part of my role here. Obviously, these days, they're not as frequent as what they used to be. But hopefully, in future, we'll get back to doing regional um, outreach. Um, particularly during COVID, um, I'm, I was managing our um, social media trying to get things from the collection into our social media feeds. So if any of you are sitting at home and following us on social media, in particular the hashtag content for connection, that was something that I was working very hard on um, when we were in, um, in lockdown. So I've just included a few things where you can follow us online. 
Um, and a lot of us do spend um, quite a lot of thought and effort in putting, um, yeah, things from the collection online because we know it's difficult for people to understand what we do behind the scenes. We can't do tours as regularly as what we used to, so we just want to give people the opportunity to see what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and here's an example of another kind of outreach that we have done. This is Shirley. Hi, I'm Shirley Sorokin. I'm a collection manager here in the Marine Invertebrate section of the South Australian Museum. I was lucky in that I grew up in Fiji, walking on reefs and snorkeling. My mother was a shell collector and my father was a doctor, but he had a special interest in marine stings. And so we had an aquarium at home with all sorts of dangerous marine animals in it that I love to look at. Well, I normally work on sponges as my speciality, but this particular thorny urchin here is my favourite collection item. This was collected in the Great Australian Bite by Society Aquatic Sciences and was donated to the museum as part of a very large collection of marine invertebrates. The reason I love this urchin so much is because it's like a mini reef itself. It has many spines with thorns on them that belong to itself, but on those thorns are growing other marine organisms. For example, I can see a lace coral, which is a bryzoan, some tiny baby stony corals, a sponge, and some ascidians. So urchins have their mouths at the bottom of their organism, and they have their anuses at the top. So I'll just leave that there. If you want to see what else she says, um, please go to our YouTube videos, um, YouTube channel, and you'll see lots of videos of behind the scenes and collection managers um, talking about the collection and what they love. Um, now, another form of outreach in particular for research is to do scientific um, presentations. And so this is an example of Rachel and I giving talks at the AMSA, um, the Australian Marine Sciences Association conference that was held in Adelaide a couple of years ago. And um, we still to this day try and continue to do these presentations. So why do we do all this? Um, and that's a bit of a question mark by an octopus there. <clears throat> Well, there is, there is an act, the South Australian Museum Act. Um, so we do have a, a responsibility to these collections to make sure they are maintained for, you know, in perpetuity. Um, we are the permanent record of species as data and specimens, um, particularly for long term. Um, we do educational outreach, with, which is important for society these days. We support research, so not only do we do our own research, but we support researchers from all over the world to do their research as well. As I mentioned, we are the library of life, so we want to maintain this library so it's available for all of us. Uh, we have such a wide group of stakeholders. This is not even all of them, but, you know, we have researchers, we have the public, we have our volunteers, we have school groups, we have local interest groups like you guys, the um, EMS group. Um, but, I mean, as personal individuals working here, we do it because we literally love doing our job. Um, we've come from various different backgrounds, but we're all here because we really um, are interested and um, just want to do our best for the collection and the marine invertebrates. So I hope that um, has given you a bit more information about the collection and what we do here. Feel free to put comments in below and I'll try and answer them as soon as possible. Thanks for listening.